stay with me. I think we should go back to letting women fight over men. My friends call me a loser because I'm still hanging around. I've heard so many rumors that I'm just a girl that you bang on the couch. I Hello. So one thing that you probably don't know about me is that I am historically and on record a five-time Platinum Award winning reality TV hater, <laughs> particularly reality TV dating shows. I have had like a visceral reaction to the concept of shows like The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, Love is Blind, Love Island, the whole thing. However, one of the great paradoxes of my life is that despite my extreme distaste for reality TV, I absolutely fucking love Unreal. Unreal is a 2015 scripted television show from Lifetime, and it follows the mentally ill producers of a show that is kind of modeled off of The Bachelor, so a bunch of women dating one man. And I was reminded of this because I got a comment on one of my videos that was like, you remind me of the girl from Unreal, and I feel like they must have meant Rachel. I'm assuming they meant Rachel. Wow, okay. I just... Can someone get me a drink? Oh, can somebody get me a drink, please? I, uh... Come on. Which could be an insult, but I'm choosing to take it as a compliment. <laughs> and it just reminded me of this this thing in my life where like I I feel bad about it. I have been sitting in a room full of women that I love and respect, like smart, brilliant women who are thoroughly enjoying unironically some kind of reality show like the Kardashians or The Bachelor. And I've just been like, it's like nails on a chalkboard. And I don't like that. I don't like that feeling. I don't like that feeling. It feels very not like other girls. It feels very pick me. I'm not a fan of it. So I did what I always do, which is investigate my own media consumption, right? So in a desperate attempt to make a video that doesn't involve a certain ancient Greek tragedy, I thought, why not investigate and see if I can finally kick my anti-reality TV bias to the curb and just like learn to have fun. So I watched The Bachelor, I watched The Bachelorette, I watched Love is Blind, I watched Love Island, and I watched a little bit of Too Hot to Handle. And I read a bunch of scholarly journals and articles and think pieces and tried really hard to trick my little brain into getting on board. And it kind of worked because one thing that I learned is that the, the reality part of reality TV is like the least important part. The level of realness is almost entirely irrelevant when it comes to like the core appeal of this type of show and why we're watching them. And when I say this type of show, I am specifically talking about reality TV dating shows. I'm probably going to say reality shows and reality TV a bunch, but I'm only really referring to dating shows because you couldn't pay me enough to watch Survivor, okay? Sorry. That said, I had a grand old time watching these these reality shows. I had a great time learning to love The Bachelorette, and I am very excited to share that journey with you. This is not going to be a society of the spectacle, unwatched life is not worth living video. I feel like people have already covered that. They've already covered the like reality hyper reality. I kind of covered the reality hyper reality thing in my like artist responsibility video. So we're not really going to do that. Instead, what we're going to do is take a look at how we consume these shows and more importantly why we consume them and when we zoom out and look at like grand scale what does our like 20 year long consistent obsession with specifically like the bachelor and the bachelorette what does that say about us as a society as a culture what are we trying to work out and understand either consciously or unconsciously and have we been successful that is the question of the hour. Friendly reminder, this is Pillow Talk, the series where I kind of research, but mostly just hang out and talk shit. Part one. So like, what is it? What? Why? Why? Why did we pick that? I think there's a couple of things. I think there's elements of fantasy. I think there is sort of a bit of schadenfreude and just a lot of human nature. But one thing that I did find when I was 
really trying to answer this question of like, what is it about one man dating 26 women at the same time that is so appealing to America, at least? One thing I kept coming back to is the idea of like communication and connection, right? Like one of the th first things that happens in Unreal, which is the scripted Lifetime show, is that our main girly, hot mess extraordinaire, Rachel Goldberg, who is a producer on this Bachelor-esque show, takes all of the contestants' cell phones. And it's like pretty well known that in reality TV in the real world, that also happens. Like you usually, for most of the shows, I feel like don't get to have your phone. They usually take your phone away. Now that's probably more for like preventing leaks and like keeping them isolated from the press and stuff like that, but also has the sort of side effect of like forcing the participants to have like actual meaningful conversations. And that's like what we all want and that's what we all crave. However, we don't actually need to give up our phones and go on an eight week lockdown on a reality television show in order to like deepen our connections with our partners because we luckily have the Paired app which is the sponsor of this week's video. Ooh, a sponsor. Fancy. We talk about connection and communication on this channel all the time. And so often we are talking about all of the things that make communicating with our loved ones more difficult. And it's not often that we get to talk about the ways that communication technology is making our relationships and communication with our loved ones easier and more fun. The Paired app is an app for couples. It's designed for couples of all shapes and sizes that any stage of a relationship Relationship, whether you just met at a library or you are hand in hand in a nursing home, it's got you covered. It makes taking care of your relationship not only fun with like games and quizzes, but also easy. There are so many different types of conversations that you can start with your partner. And one thing that I really love about it is that you have to answer the question yourself in order to unlock your partner's answer. So there's this like exchange of trust and honesty and vulnerability going on that helps deepen your relationship as well. Also, you guys know I love a good timeline. Love a good history lesson. I love taking it all the way back. And the Paired app is no exception. The timeline feature on the Paired app is really cool because you can add not only like normal traditional milestones, but you can sort of just add anything that you want. Add memories and pictures and quotes. You get to build this timeline together just like you're building a relationship together. Click my link below to get a seven day free trial and 50% off of Paired Premium to deepen your connection with your partner. Now where were we? Ponies, princesses, romance, love, I don't know, it's all a bunch of crap anyways. Let's go people. We're all about to find out if Sean has indeed found the love of his life. It's a bachelor first that very well could provide one of the most beautiful moments in bachelor history. That's right. Well, let me give you a little rundown of The Bachelor and kind of explain to you how The Bachelor slash Bachelorette works because it's a lot. We start with The Bachelor. Are The Bachelor. I'm the bachelor. The eligible bachelor is usually a single, financially secure, but not particularly wealthy, white or white passing man from the Midwest or the South. Wants kids, but won't specify exactly how many. He wants a wife and someone to share his life with, but just hasn't found the right girl yet. He just hasn't. Luckily, we have many options for him. We have like 20 something options, and depending on the season that you're watching and whether or not they leave early. Sorry, Clayton. But it's usually somewhere around 25 gorgeous single women. The Bachelor goes out of his way to find the most beautiful estheticians, preschool teachers, wedding photographers, and in later seasons, nurses in the world, okay? And they file them out of this limo one by one to introduce themselves to The Bachelor and then go inside this mansion where they will all be living for the next like eight weeks. I say all, they will not all be living there because we have to eliminate some of these options. First night luckily does usually knock off like 10 of them, okay? So he will go around and chit chat. We vibe, we vibe, we did not vibe, she's crazy. And eventually they narrow it down to like 15. This is the most boring episode of the show. This is the most boring part of the whole process, I think because for the first time in my life, I find myself feeling like there are just too many beautiful women in the room. I can't keep track. But the whole point of this first night and this first episode is for him to choose about 15 of the 25 to continue on the journey with him because that's that's the language that we use. There's a lot of particular language in The Bachelor. The Bachelor decides who is going to continue on the journey with him via a rose ceremony. This is absurd. This is the most ridiculous thing. 
no, it's not. There's a lot of ridiculous things. This is so funny. So the rose ceremony is when the bachelor gets a bunch of roses and he hands them out to the women one by one, along with the phrase, will you accept this rose? Will you accept this rose? Which gives them the opportunity to say no if they want, which doesn't happen often, except to Clayton. And then we just rinse and repeat. Every week, the girls sort of wait patiently and eagerly for a date card, or in some of the early cases, like I think the, the Bachelorette had like video cards, but it's like Tyra Mail if you've ever watched America's Next Top Model. They get a little card that will tell them if they are going on a group date, which is an insane thing, where several women go on the same date with the same man at the same time. And by date, I mean some kind of like photo shoot on the beach or photo shoot of a romance novel or photo shoot for a dress. There's a lot of photo shoots. They do a lot of photo shoots for these date activities, but it's a lot of photo shoots. But if they're not on the group date, then they could possibly be invited to either a two-on-one date, which is exactly what it sounds like. Two women on the date with the same man or the oh-so-coveted one-on-one, which is like a one-on-one -one Date. Because you have to specify in Bachelor Land whether or not your date has multiple people on it or not. I can't believe that none of these women started sleeping together. If it wasn't so straight, it would be so gay. Do you realize like how heterosexual the vibes need to be for you to have a group date that isn't doesn't feel gay? <laughs> the heterosexuality is off the charts okay but we're not judging them for it because they're fucking insane this is like a gift to humanity the shit that they make these women and men on the bachelor do is bonkers okay they made them all strip into bikinis and polar plunge at one point a girl got hypothermia they dress them up in absurd costumes and they make them like act shit out and they just they go to like weird picnic locations there was one where they had to do it was like an obstacle course in like the woods and they had to like saw wood in half to like win a date or win a row it's fucking nuts i can't believe they have been doing this for 20 years i don't think people are talking enough about how fucking nuts the dates that they they put these women on are like i don't i don't think that we're giving that enough attention but anyway they go on these dates every episode you get a rose ceremony uh where we start knocking them off knocking them off the jenga tower which is great because i feel like the the bachelor is best when there's like six girls or less i feel like six is even pushing it but like you want to like once you've got like a final three or four that's when shit gets really interesting because when you get down to like three or four is when they get to go to like the hometown dates okay so they go to hometown dates where the bachelor flies to meet all of their family and then they all usually fly to some like exotic fancy like vacation location spot place where they can like advertise for some hotel or resort usually at which the contestants are given the option after their dates to forego their individual hotel rooms in favor of the shared fantasy suite. So they bone. Um, and this is where things get real fun. It's not explicitly said this is the, the sex episode, right? But they're definitely implied to be having sex in the fantasy suite. Sometime after fantasy suites, they get down to two final final contestants the bachelor will choose one of them to propose to and one of them to utterly humiliate and crush on national television just a fun fun old heterosexual time so those are the basics okay and there are a couple of rules occasionally you can get given a rose on a date or you can like win a rose at a challenge or win like a first impression rose on the first night which gives you like immunity from the elimination i mean uh grants you safety in the rose ceremony 
I don't know how they phrase that, but it's immunity, right? It's like you just, you don't get, you can't get eliminated. You can't get kicked off after you get that rose. Occasionally, The Bachelor can be a little ballsy and decide that he's going to switch it up and just start handing roses out willy-nilly whenever he wants. I'm going to break the rules a little bit. Sean, this is very stressful for our lovely ladies. <gasps> she has a rose. What is going on here? Something's obviously up. There's like two roses now. No, there's only one. No, there's a girl over in the other room that's holding a rose. Someone got another rose? I saw another girl holding a rose. It wasn't Tiara. And then that becomes like a whole thing that they work into the show. There is also like an unspoken rule on The Bachelor that if you ask The Bachelor if you can steal him for a moment, whatever he's doing or wherever he is, like, he has to say yes. So, like, he could be making out with another girl. And if you go up and you're like, I'm sorry, can I steal you for a moment? He, like, has to go, which I find is so funny. But the most interesting, like, mechanic of The Bachelor by far is the fact that you are allowed to admit that you are on a show. The Bachelor is very self-aware. I didn't know this going into it. I assumed that they must be, like talking around it but they are very open about the fact that they are on a show you are allowed to admit that it's a show you are not allowed to admit that it's a competition it's not a contest it's not a competition it's a process they're very big on this process works and i believe in this process it seems like they have some rules about when you can say that you've fallen for somebody and when you're allowed to say I love you. Oh, and they uh, are obsessed with uh, the the right reasons. That's a big thing is, is people who are there for the right reasons versus the wrong reasons is a very common thing that you'll hear in The Bachelor a lot. But it's very self-aware. It's very in conversation with itself because the bachelor is chosen from the losers <laughs> of the previous season of the bachelorette and that bachelorette was chosen from the losers of the previous season of the bachelor and so forth so it's like very insular all 25 specifically signed up just to meet you what a humbling feeling i'm casey casey was on ben's season <laughs> So everybody like knows like a lot of the contestants get told like this is who The Bachelor is and they all know who he is because they watched him on The Bachelorette last season. The Bachelor is Sean. <laughs> no way! No way! And they're allowed to admit that and they're allowed to talk about that and they talk about the show and what it's like to be on a show and to be The Bachelor and be The Bachelorette and it's very aware of it which I thought was wild and so like d is crazy is crazy and is absolutely part of the magic of it for sure which I will get into in a minute but I think that that is mostly everything that you need to know about The Bachelor oh wait no actually no the only other th only other thing to know is that if you are watching The Bachelor or The Bachelorette and you think to yourself at any point no they wouldn't do that um yes they would the risk of bodily harm or death is like under 60 percent i guarantee you the bachelor will do it they once had two bachelorettes this year's bachelorette jen got engaged in her last episode and then the man that she got engaged to like cruelly dumped her two weeks later and was like actually i never loved you fuck off and they made her watch her proposal on national television and just filmed her sobbing fucking nuts um so that is the bachelor the bachelorette is very similar pretty much kind of the same vibes there are wild cards they do occasionally pull out something that's never happened before in bachelor slash bachelorette history and by occasionally i mean every year <laughs> but but it's that's that's it and here's the thing that's so fucking wild about it is that like i think thought i was really stuck on reality tv shows because i was like it's fake because i'd seen unreal and unreal is about the people who make this show and it's about the way that they manipulate and they they construct and create these scenarios for these women who are getting like 
humiliated on national television, right? Like they, Rachel makes a girl shit herself on national TV, which is so fucking funny. <laughs> I don't think The Bachelor's ever done that, but I don't, I wouldn't put it past them, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the beginning. Rachel Goldberg is a producer on Everlasting. Everlasting is basically The Bachelor, but instead of a bachelor, they have a suitor. And Rachel Goldberg is returning to set for the first time after having a very public breakdown. Yeah. Be afraid, okay? Crazy's back. Don't ever be rushed to hug me at one time. I'm. Shit. At the end of last season, she gets really drunk and like wanders into shot when they're filming and they're broadcasting live and she calls her job Satan's asshole and then she steals a car. So she is like coming back with DUI and Grand Theft Auto and a lot of concerned glances. When we first meet Rachel, she is wearing a this is what a feminist looks like t-shirt and I just want you to remember that because it's gonna come back and it's gonna be important later. But she is producing the girls. She is also crazy in the most affectionate way possible. She is a little nuts. You get the feeling that she may go a little bit too far. Right. From one slut to another. Did you just call me a slut? No, I just called myself a slut. <laughs> right. When I first watched the show, I thought that it must be an insane parody because I thought there's absolutely no way that this is really what's going on on The Bachelor. And like, I kind of stand corrected, like minus the bodies. They're not that different. What is different though, is that the focus of Unreal is on the producers, particularly Rachel and her boss, Quinn. Let me entertain you. Why? Because I want back then. What Unreal is really concerned with is not necessarily the drama of the reality show itself, but how it is produced and how the producers manufacture and create this drama. How are they manipulating the cast and the circumstances that the cast find themselves in in order to get specific reactions, right? Maybe that white dress wasn't such a good idea after all. <laughs> And the general consensus, like when you read behind the scenes or, you know, post show interviews or people even talking about how accurate Unreal is, is that like it's pretty accurate. They're like, yeah, I mean, people don't die that often. They definitely go too far. But for the most part, like, yeah, we get the girls really drunk. We ask them invasive questions. We push their buttons, put them in situations that we know are going to make them lash out and be uncomfortable. When I first lived in New York the first time, I was a nanny and I used to work on a playground with like another mom who used to be a reality TV producer on like TLC shows. I think it was like the like 90 Day Fiance and stuff like that. She was like, yeah, no, that's exactly how it goes. All you do is just get people drunk and embarrass them on TV. She was like, I just couldn't. After I had a kid, I couldn't do it, which I thought was crazy because people sign up for this. Like they know what's going on. They know that it's a show and they do it anyway. <laughs> Why? 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 Why are they signing up for this show where they're going to get fake engaged and then break it off after three months? Why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? Because they don't always break it off after three months. Oh, no, they do not. Occasionally, occasionally it works out. Every once in a while, it works. I watched like three or four seasons at random. And the first season that I chose to watch because it was one of the only ones available on like Tubi or Freebie was Sean's season. And the girl that I really liked got kicked off and I was bummed about it. And so I was like, oh, I Googled like who wins. And all these articles come up about Sean and Catherine celebrating their 10th anniversary. And I was like, okay, wait, 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 wait. That's like a long time. They have like 17 children. That's like a lot of, that's a lot of years. I didn't, I knew, I thought they were all breaking up after like a year max. I didn't think that they were like doing their taxes. You know what I mean? Like I didn't think that that's how serious some of these relationships were. And it made me rethink this. And it made me wonder, like, is it possible that it's both? Is it possible that these are people who know they're on a show and are performing for this show and also actively participating in this 
courtship process. Is it possible that like when they say like they're here for the right reasons, they mean it? And I think the answer is yes. <laughs> Part two, the fantasy and the sweet. Here's the thing about watching the first episode of either The Bachelor or The Bachelorette is that the conversations that are being had are so frank and so forward that like there really is no way to get confused. <laughs> Let's just fast forward and say it works out with okay, you Okay, then I would design my own. You would design your own wedding dress. Oh, of course. And the wedding would be phenomenal. Phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. And I've really enjoyed getting to know you. Oh, that's and great. I want to learn a lot more about you. So good. <laughs> so. It is almost alien to the way that we communicate and enter into relationships in the year of our Lord 2024. Because we spend weeks talking, texting, and maybe going on a date or maybe going on several dates and like talking around like, oh, we're friends or oh, we're just seeing each other or oh, we're casual. We are in a world of like hookup culture and decision fatigue, right? Or what is they they call it like choice fatigue? I'll put the word up on the screen. We are in this like era sort of psychological space i guess as a culture where like there's too many options and we're all just like terrified to commit and it's so hard to just like get a solid answer out of somebody and there is something so refreshing watching the bachelor and the bachelorette about these people who just met looking each other in the eye and being like do you feel a spark because i feel a spark do you feel a spark and then being like yeah or no <laughs> like being like, oh, great, like, because this feels really good. I would like to date you. And then they'll be like, great, solid. How many kids do you want? And they're like, three. And they're like, oh, I don't want any kids. And it's like, okay, good to know. Send them home. Like, there's something so refreshing about the frankness. And I started to realize, like, I think that that's the fantasy. I think that that is part of what is so attractive about it. Because then I started thinking about the fact that, like, oh, my God, how great might it be to know for a fact that you are having drinks with someone and it is definitely a date. Like, even if there's 26 other girls on this date, how great would it be to be on a date and know for sure that it's a date? Like, everybody is there. Everybody who is there knows what they're there for. Everybody has agreed. We are here for romance. This is the pursuit of a romantic connection. It's not like, oh, I'm hoping to bump into somebody or, oh, I'm like kind of seeing this person occasionally or like, oh, they're in a relationship and it's never the right time and da 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 and like they were texting me but then they're not texting me and it's, it's none of that. There's no, you don't have to look at Instagram stories. Nobody's like, oh, well, then I saw this person on her story or da da da. It's just you show up and everybody is like, I am here to pursue this romantically and that is so nice. That is what I think is so appealing about it because we don't do that anymore. We have lost that. We don't have a courtship ritual in our, at least like, you know, Western American society. And we haven't for a long time. We haven't since we've had the internet, since we've had match.com, since we've had chat rooms in general, since we have had like long distance internet communications, we have not had the traditional courtship ritual. And I don't think it's a coincidence that The Bachelor rises in popularity as our ability to clearly define whether or not we are in relationships with each other plummets into Mary Armstrong. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think that it is directly related. And I have evidence. <laughs> I have evidence to back it up. In a 2004 article for The New Atlantis, Christine Rosen writes about romance in the information age. And she writes that rapid improvement in communication technologies and the expansion of their practical uses continues unabated. And this is in 2004, okay? She writes, the confidence man of the 19th century with his dandified ruses is replaced by the well-chosen screen name and false autobiography of the unscrupulous internet dater. 
courtship as it once existed, a practice that assumed adherence to certain social conventions and recognition of the differences, physical and emotional, between men and women, has had its share of pleased obituaries. The technologies we use on a daily basis do not merely change the ways logistically we pursue love, they are, in some cases, transforming the way we think and feel about what exactly it is we should be pursuing. Romance, like, wasn't always thing really i think we've always had these feelings of like love and romance but we didn't really call it that the sort of romantic era is like way more about being sad than it is about being in love it's definitely about being in love but like mostly about byron being really sad when i watched love island for the first time i noticed that like the season that i decided to watch all of the contestants were very clear to emphasize they did not use dating apps they didn't like dating apps and that's why they were single right they didn't they wanted to meet someone organically they wanted to meet someone naturally whether or not that's true god knows but that was something that they always said and i feel like we are all exhausted by by dating apps everybody who dates i'm sure actually probably the aromantic people are probably fine but like those of us who do seek romantic connection are exhausted by them we all know the statistics right we know that men statistically just keep swiping right on every girl and women are tired of having to swipe left on so many men <laughs> and don't even get me started on setting your settings to, to women only when you're a woman it's Oh my god, it's a mess because there's just too many options. There's just too many options. And we get it in our head. It's like gambling. They they say that like almost winning does the same thing to your brain that winning does. It's not about the hand you're playing. It's about what hand you might get next and what, you know, roll of the dice. We're afraid to commit to swiping one way because we don't know what we're going to see next, right? And we, we know that there will be another option. There will always be another option. There are so many options we're exhausted by it we're exhausted by sending messages and not getting any reply or going back and forth and then ghosting or going on dates that are where the the vibe is just not there it's tiresome i i get that it might just be easier to like go on a show where within five minutes you just get a boyfriend like i i get it i as a person who's never been in a serious committed relationship and has never had like a partner i get it because there was a girl on love island when everybody asked how long you've been single she was like forever and i was like i feel you and they were like oh my god really and she was like yeah it's just never been serious it's never gotten there and the host was like well you're about to have your first boyfriend in the next five minutes and i was like that sounds great sign me up please Nobody wants to be looking. We just don't want to look. It's such a waste of time. It's so stressful. I just felt wine on my ear. But like, there's something so attractive about that, that like, honestly, yeah, if you're like an outward sort of extroverted person who doesn't really mind conflict or feels like you can hold your own in like a weird manipulative situation i can totally see why someone would be like you know what fuck it like at this point i get it and this isn't just communication technology's fault it's not just dating apps faults although i will give them quite a bit of blame for this but like the automobile like the invention of like the car did more for sexual liberation and freedom and expression and like exploration than anything before that because as soon as people could just get in a car and go park in the woods somewhere it was game over like casual sex was on the table and it was just much easier and much more liberating and with that comes the eventual realization that like oh if teenagers are able to now go off and bone in the woods we need to make sure that they know the consequences of doing that so let's do sex ed and once you start talking about something more often it's like okay maybe this actually isn't that big of a deal right and like let's make sure we're doing it safely and then you know men start being shitty about it and then feminists and queer women really champion the like stop slut shaming women thing and we end up in this great like sexually liberated society is great i'm not saying that we should go back to chastity belts i'm not i'm not advocating for chastity chastity belts i'm just saying we now live in a world where things can be so casual that it's confusing 
Barbara Whitehead was the co-director of the National Marriage Project from Rutgers University and the author of Why Are There No Good Men Left, where she told reporters that traditional mating systems where you meet someone in your neighborhood or at a college or at some kind of, you know, structured event or scenario, some kind of third place, is pretty much dead, right? Right. And there's a huge population of working professionals who simply do not have the time or the opportunity to go through an elaborate courtship ritual. Capitalism. Capitalism is killing dating, right? Because everybody's working so goddamn much all the fucking time that nobody has time for dates. Nobody has time to go on seven dates a week to try and find one decent person who is also tired and exhausted from going on seven different dates in a week like it's crazy and on top of that we as a society for like good reasons have kind of discouraged dating within the workplace right we're like hey don't date at your work that's going to be messy and usually is but like when you're spending all of your time at work and then you can't date the people at your work like, we're running out of options online seems like a great perfect solution however our communication technologies encourage the erosion of boundaries necessary for the growth of a relationship. They demand like full transparency and encourage oversharing because we find it a lot easier to talk to a screen alone in our room like I'm doing now or typey, 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 all your personal details. That's a lot easier to do than to tell someone in person about yourself. And so we are just like trauma dumping under the guise of like being honest and putting it all out there and like skipping the bullshit. Imagine if the girlies on The Bachelor said some of the shit that you have heard on a first date in the last five years. If they said that right out the bat, if they were like, hey, want to hear my trauma? It would be a lot and they'd probably get sent home because there are rules. There are rules on The Bachelor. You can't say I love you till like week six or something like that. You have to, you have to go through, I can see myself falling in love with you. I think I'm falling in love with you. I'm definitely falling in love with you. I am in love with you. Will you marry me? You have to go through all the phases. And you do it in eight weeks. You've got fuck all else to do. You don't have to be at work. That's another thing that's really interesting about it is like these are people who have kind of decided to put their entire lives on hold for like the opportunity at love. They, it's, it's all you have to do. We've sucked all the mystery out. We've sucked all of the intrigue because we just dump everything on the table on the first date because we don't want to waste our time on a relationship that's not going to go anywhere because A, we don't want to get hurt and B, like we don't have the fucking time because we're all working our asses off trying not to drown under capitalism. It really does always come back to capitalism. Lord Byron did not have a job. He was in constant debt. That's the only reason he could afford to fuck around the way that he does. But in the bachelor land, traumas and, and deep-seated personal issues are revealed very strategically. They wait. Even the audience doesn't get to know that person's drama until they have a relationship with them, until they've been kept a certain number of weeks. And then it starts to be like, well, why do you have trouble opening up? And then it's like, well, my dad left when I was a kid. And like, that. there you go. Now we're all, now we're all bonded. We're in a little a little threesome this is the straightest show with the gayest setup so i see what it appeals to i see the fantasy but it is still just a fantasy whether we like it or not we are in the information technology age we're not living in a world where there is an option to do courtship traditionally <laughs> In The End of Romance, The Demystification of Love in the Postmodern Age, James Dowd and Cole Pelota write that historical circumstances have reinforced in our culture an increasingly hedonistic, tr strategic, monitored, self-reflexive, rational, and instrumental approach to the relationships of everyday social life. We have fucked with our own brains to the point where like that would be really forward and a little bit weird you know if somebody started trying to do old school courtship maybe we could all get on board I don't know maybe that's too far I don't know this is pillow talk I haven't really thought everything out or scripted much of it but that's just not the world that we live in right and I don't like the conclusion of like technology bad end of I think any argument where you say we have to go back is usually not a good one right progress I think is ideal and are these reality shows that are sort of preying on this fantasy and stroking the flames of this old school 
Penelope in Odysseus picking from the suitors and like, oh, uh, what is it? Taming of the Shrew and uh, what was the other one? What's the one Merchant of Venice with the three caskets? This old school kind of Bridgerton matchmaking fantasy. Are we doing more harm than good? According to celebrity matchmaker and dating expert Rachel London, society is doomed because of how shallow current dating shows are. She got interviewed for Muscle and Health and said that one of the significant changes brought about by these dating shows is the increased emphasis on instant gratification and superficiality. Contestants on these shows are often chosen based on their looks and potential for creating drama rather than focusing on deeper compatibility factors. This has led to a culture where appearance and entertainment entertainment value are prioritized over long-term compatibility and genuine emotional connections. People have started to believe that finding love should be quick and glamorous, emphasizing physical attraction rather than building a solid foundation. Shows like Love Island also openly encourage body hopping and the idea of exploring all options. These scenes are basically replicating the dating app swiping experience, Tinder, Bumble, Hinge, and again, giving the paradox of choice. We don't live in The Bachelor land. We don't live on Love Island. That's not real. And on top of that, the fantasy is not all that happens on these shows. It's manipulated, it's structured, it's scripted to a degree, but it's it's scripted for humiliation. It's scripted for, for drama and for angst and for schadenfreude. The stuff that goes on on these shows is not just fantasy. There are 26 women, 25, 24. There's a lot of women on The Bachelor. And the majority of the screen time on these shows is not given to all of the sweet, fantastical moments of clear communication and, and happy falling in love. It's not a show about two people falling in love. None of these are shows about two people falling in love. These are shows about a whole bunch of people fighting for love. Part three, I actually hate that little ginger bitch. I hate her. I hate her. The question is, given everything that I've just said about like the fantasy of like love and healthy communication, is it really like ethical or even remotely appropriate for us to be humiliating women mostly on television just so that we can like act out and live out our fantasies of easier communication like is that is that appropriate because i kind of don't think that it is objectively i feel like it's not fair for us to say oh well they know what they're signing up for because do they how much informed consent can you really give for an experience like that? In the most recent Bachelorette, Jen chose Devin, who is, um, how do you say, like, a pile of garbage in, like, a language that a douchebag will understand? I don't know. But he's shitty. And he basically just played her for, like, the whole season, acted so in love with her, and then we find out he called her and broke off their engagement with like a 15 minute phone call. He had basically said that he didn't love me anymore and didn't feel the same way and felt like something had been off since the second that he proposed, he regretted getting engaged and I didn't know. Gasps. I had to change the camera battery, but point is this horrible thing happens. A bunch of it happens off camera after the show is wrapped and then they make they sit there and they make her watch like her proposal and watch how she truly believed that this guy loved her and she's amazing and she clearly is coming out like stronger and better for it but like it's so cruel <laughs> everybody was reacting saying like this was awful like they owe her an apology why did they make her do that there's a lot of question also about like, would they have done that with a white bachelorette? And I think, I think yes, because I think that the bachelor and the bachelorette will always go there. But I, I do, I do see the point. I do also agree that the bachelor and the bachelorette are not great at handling racism at all. They definitely stereotype women, particularly women of color in the edits and very much lean into negative stereotypes. It took like almost 20 years for there to be a black bachelorette and she got such insane, like just racist hate that the show did nothing about. I am not excusing the bachelor and the bachelorette of racism. What I'm saying is that the show absolutely will humiliate any of its contestants at any 
any point. They usually try to protect the bachelor or the bachelorette as much as possible, but at the end of the day, they want good TV. And now the memory card is full. Thank God this is a pillow talk. The point is, The Bachelor is not very nice to its contestants and has no problem painting them in a less than lovely light. The season of The Bachelorette where they had two bachelorettes, not the season where they had two bachelorettes the whole time, but the season of The Bachelorette where they had two women who thought they were going to be The Bachelorette, two women who have already done The Bachelor thing. They've already suffered through not being chosen over and over and over and over again. And instead of being like, here, you don't have to be chosen anymore. You get to choose. They made the men vote via like roses in a goddamn casket for who they wanted to be the bachelorette that season, which is like, a ju- a, 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 what? Like, horrible, cruel, genuinely, like just pitting these women against each other. So not only does poor Brit get told after like one night of being the bachelorette that she's not going to be the bachelorette anymore and gets like sent back to her hotel room in tears but now caitlin the winning bachelorette has to deal with the fact that like several men in that room definitely didn't vote for her and didn't want her to be the bachelorette but they're still here and she's here it was cruel it was cruel tell you that because i want you to understand that i am not team pit women against each other okay i think that's fucked up however i touched on this very briefly in my first ever pillow talk about Taylor Swift. It's dangerous territory, but stay with me. I think we should go back to letting women fight over men. I think, I think it's fine. Let them fight. Let them, let them fight. I think it's fun. I think it's fine. You know why I think it's fine? Because when I was in middle school and I had drama with a girl, I got pulled into the principal's office with this girl at one point. And I will never forget the principal looking at us both and saying, I wish you were boys because if you were, I'd let you go out in the hallway. You'd punch it out and it would be over and we'd never hear about it again. And it made me like embarrassed and feel bad at the time because it was like our sixth fight. It was like the, the like... 14th time that me and this girl had been like having issues and like bullying and like talking about each other and blah 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 and so it made me feel like our drama and what was going on was like somehow wrong because of the fact that we couldn't just like ignore it and let it go and because of the fact that it was complex and because there was a back and forth and obviously I was 13 I could not articulate any of this then but I feel like we may have taken the concept of the girl's girl a little bit too far okay hear me out the bachelor and the bachelorette got so much criticism particularly in 2010s during that pop feminism that like Disney princesses are bad cat calling is the worst thing that can happen to women and like like white feminism era. Like during that time, The Bachelor and The Bachelorette got a lot of heat for the fact that they were, especially on The Bachelor, just like having 26 women fight over a man. And I think that's where my initial distaste for these kinds of shows came from. Like I was 216 years old in 2015. So I was very like, I'm not like other girls at all. And yet, the show was still fucking running. It stayed running. It stayed running. People were still watching it. People are still watching it. So even though we had this big cultural shift in, like, women should support other women, which is good, people still wanted to watch it. And I just don't know if I believe that, like, anybody who likes watching women fight is a misogynist. Like, I just don't know if I believe that. I feel like there has to be something else. And I think that that something else is complexity. I think that it is the fact that, like, they won't just punch it out. It is the fact that, like, girls and and women and people who are socialized as girls from a very young age, part of socialization like that, and I mean, I can only speak to, like, the white suburban experience. It's like a rite of passage. You fight with your friends, and then you're not friends, and then you're friends again. And, like, parents have to, like, keep a scoreboard of, like, is my daughter friends with this girl this week or not? Or are they fighting? I have a family of all women, in case you haven't known. I I don't have, there's no men in my family. And it's just me and my mom and my sister. And when we fight, we fucking go at it. We go for the throat. We go for the jugular. It is a massacre. And then we make breakfast. (laughs) Fighting 
and getting over fights, I feel like, is a testament to the elasticity and durability and endurance of the sort of female rage that everybody's talking about or like the emotional stability of women and people who are raised and socialized as as women it's just not that deep and i feel like people criticize these shows for like highlighting women fighting over men and it's like the only one centering the men in that conversation is you like i don't see him on screen i don't see him on screen i see them two on screen i see them two tearing each other down i saw five women manipulate and calculate a covert psyop operation to get the bachelor to cut tiara without him knowing that they wanted her gone because they didn't like her and it was wild and i watched him make a whole ordeal about how he doesn't like drama and then there's others who want to spend their time talking about other women i just wish we could move past the drama and focus on our relationship and them i'll be like oh my god i'm so sorry sean and then like immediately go back to the drama only for one girl to finally bite the bullet and be like hey yeah she's crazy please make her leave you would think that the man who was like i don't like drama would have cut that girl who was like you should make her leave uh no he didn't i mean she didn't win but like this is what i'm saying like it was interesting and it was fun and they're all fine the thing about the bachelor is that like yeah it's 26 women competing for the hand of one man but like it's 26 women and one man like he is he is so not important to the grand scheme of things and what's even more interesting is when you watch the bachelorette the bachelorette is not an exact mirror the bachelorette gets way more screen time to just herself than the bachelor does and i'm not saying that any of this passes the bechtel test or that this is necessarily like good for women i'm just saying that maybe it's not as bad as we think it is and maybe we should go back to letting women fight over men i always struggle with this because i feel like I I don't think there's anything wrong with being upset that a woman stole your boyfriend. Be mad at the both of them. They both did you wrong. The boyfriend and the girl are both at fault. I think that that's fine for you to be angry about. Maybe it's because I'm queer, so like everyone's a threat all the time. I would be just as mad about a guy stealing my girlfriend as like a girl stealing my girlfriend. And I don't really understand the the gender essentialism of it all. I think there are things that girls and, and women and people who were socialized and raised as girls and women do share and have in common. And like, I always want to approach people from the place of openness and empathy and support no matter who they are. I just don't like the insistence that we need to be girls girls. And this idea that you like have to support other women all the time constantly is sort of infantilizing. I don't know, I just I feel like so much of my dislike for these reality shows at particularly the bachelor or just like dating shows was i was like why are they just like making all these women fight over men and i was just very pop white feminism very end log very pick me about it as if not fighting with women makes you a better woman which is like an insane thing to think about now and the reality is that like women's ability to fight and people, you know, socialized as women and raised as, you know, girls, people who experienced girlhood as more than just friendship bracelets, but also like mean, evil notes and like cutting up your pictures and taping them back together. Maybe that was a gay thing, but like people who experienced really intense friendships and fallouts and friendships and fallouts that's a skill. The ability to have conflict with someone and get over it is cool and it can sometimes produce incredible things incredible things like a 20 some season long running show or i don't know if anybody has been following the sophia lacourt and hallie haley i don't remember her name tiktok drama but how fucking fun has that been? That's been amazing. These girls are going at it. And it's so fun. And they're so, like, she's so unbothered by it. Let her be a bad girl. Let her be shitty. Let let women be shitty, I think, is the moral of the story. Let women be shitty because then we get this, like, really interesting, entertaining reality TV 
show thing playing out in front of us on our phones. They're both making bank. She's back together with the guy anyway. The other girl doesn't have to see them. She's dating the, the gay hairdresser. Like, they're fine. We're all fine. They'll be over it eventually. Sabrina Carpenter and, like, Camilla Cabello. Like, there's pop beef happening there. They're both benefiting off of that. They're gonna be fine. We're getting songs like Taste. Who cares about the man that that is over? Nobody. He is irrelevant. He is the fulcrum. He is the, the byproduct. He is facilitating the interesting. The girls are the interesting. We're letting the pop girlies compete again. Like, let them fight for the number one spot. Let them. Like, let them hate each other and then love each other again and make up and be mad and get over it and get back together. It's like, just let people have conflict so that they may perhaps get over said conflict. To to bring it full circle and bring it back to Unreal, I highly recommend you watch it. They just put it on Netflix. I considered doing like a whole video breakdown of it, but th th it's one of those shows that is so good that it just speaks for itself and I don't really think I have anything to add to it besides just explaining it to you. Like, But it, it, it speaks for itself. It does its job, which is present to you two incredibly badass, powerful, broken, vulnerable, monstrous, evil women who love the fucking shit out of each other and also like regularly try to ruin each other's lives. The relationship between Quinn and Rachel on Unreal is so volatile and so antagonistic at times, but it is also the strongest relationship in the show, and it is such a good example of, like, women who know where the enemy is. Quinn? I love you. I love you. You're fired. Fired! Coleman knows. Listen, I was so wrong to trust him. But Quinn, we, we really just right now, we really have to stop him. Quinn, suck it up. I need you. We're taking that asshole down. Who know when they have time to fight with each other and know when they have to stop and fight together. That's what I loved about the show when it was airing. Believe it or not, I care about you. That's funny, because right now it feels a little like blackmail. But I never gave reality TV a chance because I never took it seriously because I just wrote it off as vapid and completely false and full of stupid women who weren't worth my time and like other internalized misogynistic shit. I don't know. I'm really losing the plot here. I've been filming for almost three hours. I don't know if I'm going to be able to cut something even remotely coherent out of this. But yeah, let women fight and somebody put me on a reality reality show. That, I think, is the conclusion that we came to. Thank you again to Paired for sponsoring this video. You can click my link below to get a seven-day free trial and 50% off of Paired Premium to deepen your connection with your partner. Thank you guys for all of the crazy support on the Flowers in the Attic video. That's been nuts. I did not expect that. I can't believe 100,000 people watched me talk about incest for four hours. That's wild. Recommend me similar books. Recommend me your craziest book series that you've ever read. I would love to do another like deep dive on something like that. I really appreciate all of the love and support on that. Comment shout out from the last video goes to Pita Chick 84 I imagine the ghost of Lord Byron like a weird little raccoon that scratches on Biz's back door every time a new video rabbit hole is discovered. Yes. <laughs> and a secondary shout out to everybody telling me to do my take on Lord Byron. I will. I don't know if you can see the book. I've got several 600 page Byron books that I'm reading that I have to get through. Also, for those of you who are interested, I have watched Interview with a Vampire. I started reading it. I am eating my fucking words. They taste delicious. I am so sorry it's taken me so long. Thank you for your service in making me watch that. Oh, amazing. It's so good. I love that. I've been watching that. Um, I moved recently. 
if you couldn't tell, the vibes are different. I've moved to New York City. Uh, it, I lived here before. <laughs> it's not that exciting. If that comment shout out wasn't enough for you and you want to hear me talk through all of the comments on the Flowers in the Attic video, I did do a, a Patreon video where I just kind of read through the dissertations that you guys leave me in the comments, which please don't ever stop doing that. I love it. It's my favorite thing that out on my Patreon. I have an EP. It's called Gamora. It's very sad. It's not fun. I think it's good to listen to if you are running and sad. I feel like it's a good, it's a good like montage moment. Or if you are 26 and trapped in the backup plan, highly recommend the last song for you. I'm working on new music. It's going to be very different gonna be very fun. Uh, this video is also sponsored. I hope you guys are okay with that. I plan to be very picky with sponsorships. So, you know, I'm not shilling for capitalism yet. I'm very picky with sponsorships and I, I thought that Paired reached out at a really good time that I was already working on this video and it seemed like it was a good fit. So I think that's it. I think that's all that I have to say. I'm sorry if this has been a bit of a mess. I'm sorry if this is chaotic, especially this outro. I'm a bit of a mess. I've just moved and I have been quite sick and I'm about to have my wisdom teeth taken out and I'm very stressed and anxious about it. So I feel a little crazy, but it's fine. <laughs> It's fine. Everything's fine. Thank you guys for watching this madness. Um, I love you, but not in a parasocial way. I love you the way that birds love to be given bread by the water side. Okay? All right, bye. My friends call me a loser because I'm still hanging around. I've heard so many rumors that I'm just a girl that you bang on the couch. I thought you thought of me better. together so now when we kiss i have anger issues you said